he very smartly and very ingeniously kind of put forth the idea of, let's talk about friendship, because we talk about friendship all the time, but we don't actually know what it means. And so this presentation, the very beginning of the presentation, uh, begins with a very short audio clip of Pei giving a talk. It's eight minutes. It is specifically for us. He, I didn't take it from something else that he said before to someone else. He recorded himself. He sent it to us. So it's around eight minutes, and then after that, I'll go into the actual, um, the actual meat of the presentation afterwards. So the first part is just a blank slide with his picture and him talking. Kind of listen to that. You don't necessarily need to take notes if you don't want to, because everything else I kind of lay out afterwards. But just really take a moment to actively listen to what he's saying. That way you actually understand what's going on afterwards. And welcome all of you to the Youth Winter Camp of Compassionate Soviet Society. A few days ago, Longy texted me and asked that if I can talk to you about the meaning of the camp and what we can learn there, and the Buddhist principle and everything that he thinks that I should communicate with you. I'm quite um, interested in making a video and of course, we really want to talk to you about this. I, I really want to fly open and be with you, actually. But I was so busy, however. Then another text came from one of my friends in Vietnam. Um, we haven't met for 40 years, maybe, a little bit more than 40 years. Um, so he texted me and um, asked that um, if I remember him and if he can visit me sometime. So we have a little chat. Then from him, I also learned a few more friends that I haven't connected for a long time. Then I get onto Yalo, um, uh, a web is like Viber and Lion, and I talk to a few of them. And the more I talk to them, the uh, more I found interesting thing about my friends. All the image I have about them when I was were young. Most of them went through high school with me, and actually they go to middle school with me as well. From the sixth grade to all the way to twelfth grade until we graduate from high school, they have been with me for six years. And um, I talked to them in the course of two days, meaning um, the 20th of December 21st to the 2nd, and today's 23rd. So I, I talked to them uh, quite a lot, four or five of them, and um, we are not only text, but we only chat, and uh, we saw each other in the, the uh, video. But the most interesting thing that caught my attention was how different we are after 40 years. Um, when we were young, we had thought that this friend would be like this, would be like that. But when we grow up, everyone had a different path, different career, and everyone had different kind of success. Some had some difficulties, some have failures in their career, some have family, big family, but some have divorced and never moved on. Um, so I listened to all these stories and I look back to all of this and I was surprised I was really taken by surprise by how every life so different and we had thought that we were all the same when we were young. But as we grow, everyone took different paths, my friends. Everyone took different paths and they became different kind of people. They was not like the people, like the kids that I used to know. And they also were very surprised about me. They never thought that I would become a monk. They thought that I grew up to be a clown. I, I cannot <laughs> remember I seriously become anyone in the spiritual path. They don't think, they, they would never thought that I become a monk, but they would never thought that I would enter into any kind of public life. 
They thought that I'm just going to be an idiot and a failure, uh, a loser. <laughs> but we laughed at it because of our perception when we were young. And uh, to be a monk, that the last thing they thought about me. Anyhow, you didn't realize that um, because of friendship, we can talk about anything and we can express anything we want to express. We can say things that normally we cannot say in public or even in private conversation. But as friends, they are uh, very open to me and, and we talk about all kinds of things, all kinds of topics, all kinds of taboos that we would normally wouldn't want to talk about. I was so joyful because such an open and such a, a way of communicating with my friends. It turned out that in the Buddhist concept, we have three kinds of friends that we really want to be. One is good friends. We want to be good friends. Um, Longi will later define for you what is good friends. And then the second one is to be great friends. And the third one is to, bo to be bodhisattva friends or we call body friends. So again, good friend, great friend, and body friend. Good friend just means uh, whenever you need to talk to someone, then that person could be there when you need, and he will or she will never make any judgment about what you do, what you have done. He will be there to let you um, uh, pull out what's in your heart. He will be there, lend a shoulder. He will be there just to comfort you. A good friend is very difficult to have. A great friend, not only that he doesn't talk bad about you, but he will sometimes carry your burden. And many of the adults now in the compassionate society, we have the practice we call Sukhya Vita. Uh, we, we, we leave home to become monk and nun for a very short period of time, maybe seven days, ten days. And we, um, we become monks and nuns just for the sake of praying and practicing for those who cannot do the practice. And we transfer the minutes to them. That's the second one. The great friend and the friends care for us and share some burden with us. The third one is the bodhisattva friends, or we call bodhi friend. Uh, friends that wake us up, friends that carry us to the um, short of enlightenment, friends that really um, and deeply um, elevate us to the next kind of level of consciousness. Friends who not only are good and great, but they are also really, really unselfish. They are altruistic. They really care for us, and they never change their mind from now until eternity. So, best friends are not are good friends. Best friends are also great friends, but best friends also can be bodhisattva friends, or we call bodhi friends. So there are three kinds of friends, good friends, great friends, and body friends. I met some of this, uh, the friends I had. They are good friends. They are some of the best friends I have in my life. But then it brings me to the point that when you come to the camp, maybe what you learn there, you will forget. But you will never forget your friends. Learn to be good friends probably the most profound thing in life. If you can be in the camp for a few days and you strike up and a conversation with someone and then go deep in that conversation to understand the person you talk to completely and deeply, make friends with that person, serve that person, bring joy to that person. And you will see how your friendship can grow in the future. Nurture the friendship until you become like me, old oh man, but then you will realize that yeah. there's nothing more precious than friendship. Friendship is everything. I wish you had a great time at the camp, and I wish that you learn to be good friend, great friend, or perhaps bodhisattva friend. Thank you, and I hope to see you sometime. So, 
I really hope that none of you guys have friends that think that you guys are idiots or can be clowns in the future. But overall, I think that what Tay said is exactly right. Uh, there are a lot of people who you meet in your life who you consider to be friends. And I mentioned this yesterday, the difference between um, some of our members of our youth group who think that classmates or acquaintances are the same thing as friends. And so that it basically comes down to what you, your own definition of friend is. And it's simple for person to person. So we're going to quickly break down Tai's definitions of the different types of friendship. And before we kind of delve into each one, I want to ask you guys what your definition of each one is. Because these are Tai's definitions, right? So I kind of want to ask you before we talk to the first one, right? Can you ask, sorry, yeah, you do that. Okay, so what makes a good friend? What's a good friend to you, Mason? Someone that's got a beer for you when you, um, someone that, like, someone that comes to, like, watch you when you're sad and, like, comfort you. Yep, someone who's next to you when you're sad. Then, okay. What's a good friend to you? Uh, someone with a agreeable attitude. Agreeable attitude? Cool, so Anne is everyone's friend at this camp. Cool. <laughs> Bella, what's a good friend to you? Uh, someone who's there to have fun with you. Someone who what? To have fun with you. Someone to have fun with you? Yeah. I hope you have fun with your friends. <laughs> uh, Tony, what's a good friend to you? Uh, someone who really agrees when you have some things. Like, usually it's someone you have something to come with and you can talk about. Huh? Yeah. So you share common things with. So, I actually, what I ended up doing was for each of these different types of friend groups, good friend, great friend, or example friend, I chose a picture from a certain movie where I feel like the two people in it are that type of friend. So who here has seen Cars? Okay, great movie. Personally, whatever one was the best one, everything else after that was kind of, we won't talk about the movies. I personally think that Light McQueen and Mater are good friends. I think that they are the epitome, they are the best example you can have of good friends that you could possibly have, and you can see why from the next slide. These are things that good friends do. Good friends care for you and your feelings, and therefore they don't gossip about you, they don't fight back, they don't sabotage you, they don't slander you directly or indirectly. There are times when Lightning like McQueen, for example, he decides to go to Radio Springs, and he says, you know, this place is a complete trash heap. I don't want to be here. Right? And he tries to leave. And Maynard kind of understands that, and he says, okay, he doesn't get mad at Lightning McQueen for that, he just says, that's just who you are. And so he accepts him for that. They don't betray you, or they know how to sustain a meaningful and fruitful friendship for the same things I just mentioned before. They're there for you whenever you need him or her. They truly care about your welfare and your well being. Oh, yeah, sorry. The one. <laughs> oh, okay, you can go back. So, while you guys are writing, and I can explain a little bit more about this. Um, so they don't betray you, um, and they know how to sustain a meaningful and fruitful friendship. A lot of times, um, when you get into relationships with people, even if they're good friends with you, people have a breaking point. And you don't want to get to a point where you actually kind of have to test that limit. Sometimes you get to a time where, even though you're really good friends with someone, you might see something that's really hurtful, and the first instinctive reaction they have is to hit back, right? Whether it be through words, whether it be physically even sometimes. And so these people don't betray you. And betrayal can sometimes be something as very simple as going to someone else and telling them, you know, something bad about you that you told them in confidence. Are there whatever you need him or her? I think this one is pretty self-explanatory. Truly care about your welfare and well-being. This one ties a little bit into that idea of being selfless. Um, when you actually are doing things for yourself, right? Yesterday I talked about the fact that if you are wise, you can see the true motives in people. When you go to school, sometimes you make friends with people who are like very, very popular, right? And the very popular people sometimes will be friends with you. And if you're like me and you're not a very popular person in school, you're kind of wondering why someone who's very popular is coming up to you to talk to you, because you think to yourself. There must be something else they must be after, right? Like, do they want help with their homework? Do they want, like, like, what do they want? And so, 
true friends, great friends are people who are always there for you. And in the event, like, let's say you're sick, right? They take notes for you. They bring notes to your house. Um, if you're sick at school, um, sorry, not sick at school. If you're like me, and you live away from home, and you have no one else to take care of, and you live alone. Um, I've been sick before. I have friends who bring sleep over for me. That's something that's really, really sweet and ca uh, caring about. They spend time listening to you. That's really, honestly, the hardest thing to find. A lot of times you're not looking for someone to, um, to give you advice. Sometimes you just need someone to listen to you. And then you're going to figure it out yourself. Most of you guys are really smart people. You know how to solve your own problems. Give good and timely advice. This is the opposite of what you said. Sometimes you do need advice. But there's always the right way to say it, the right time to say it. And sometimes even in the right company to say it. They lift you up when you're down. Same stuff. And they protect you when you're being attacked, right? Whether you're being attacked by someone else, they have your back. Um, this has happened to me a couple of times in school, back in high school, where, um, not to me specifically, but I've seen it happen where there are certain groups of, of there are certain cliques in school. And some of the cliques really don't like each other. Um, one thing that I've noticed before is that if one group really doesn't like someone else and they say something, people within their, that person's friend group, even though both groups are actually full of good people, they're not bad people, they're both good people, they just don't really jive with each other, they will cover each other and they'll try to protect each other. And that's something that we should always strive to do as well. I'm going to stand up for you and stand with you. And the last one is that they can cry and laugh with you too. People who can um, enjoy your successes together with you and celebrate them with you, as well as be there for you and really uh, feel what you're going through if you're going through a really sad time. Those are the rarities. Sometimes people only want, there to, want to be there for the good times. They only want to be there for the party. But then as soon as something even remotely sad happens, they peace out, right? They're not there for you. And you, those are the people who are not really your good friends because they're only there for the good times. So those, these are all definitions that Tay gave. Right? These are all things that Tay has kind of mentioned. He wrote them out for us, and so I basically just wrote them back in. Um, so let's go a little bit now into what makes a great friend. What's a great friend to you? Jason? So a good friend, like, they will be with you, but like, they might not like, be there with you. Um, but a good friend is always going to be there with you. Yeah. I agree with that. Alvin? Um, that help you with burden. Help with your burden, yep. Yeah. <coughs> Do what? So like, like sometimes like queer things that they probably wanted to do for you and make sacrifices. Make sacrifices, yes, that's perfect, yes. Great friend understands what you're going through. Yep, yeah. mm-hmm. They think of you as like a sibling. As a sibling? Okay. Depending on how uh, old and how far apart in age, that might be tough, but like, okay. So one of the things that really stuck with me is that all the things you guys said are parts of being a good friend. Being a great friend is basically being a good friend plus a couple things, right? So these, these upcoming like couple lines are very short. Like, there's only one or two slides. Can you go back to it? Sorry. Um, I just find a new one for this one because the one thing that Joanne said is sacrifice. Sacrifice is really important because Good friends may be there for you. They can be there when it's convenient for you. If you're there and they're listening to you, you know, um, then that's something that they can do. But in this particular movie, I love this movie. Who has seen this movie? It's an old movie, but this is a good movie. Um, the story basically goes that, uh, you know, Marlon's son, Nemo, gets kidnapped away. Right? He gets taken away by this dentist, Scoot, Scoot whatever. He's basically like looking for, yeah, for his niece, okay? And basically they have to go through the entire ocean to find the sun. And he meets Dory along the way. And Dory is one of those people where has, she has short term memory loss. So she doesn't remember anything. But she has a really, really kind and loving heart. Throughout the entire adventure that they go through, there are a lot of sacrifices that are made. A lot of things that Dory has to give up to help Marlon find his son. And a lot of things that Marlon has to give up in order to kind of put it with Dory and kind of learn to care and love her too. So if you can go to the next one, okay? Great friends do all things of a good friend, plus, right, so that way you guys have to write all the other stuff again. 
nurture your fitness for a long stretch of time. The oldest span of the movie, it's like a long time for a fish to go from one end of the ocean to the other. So the entire time they're actually playing off of each other, basically teaching each other how to be good people along the way. They believe in your potential and thus they can help you stay focused to live up to it. One of the things that they mention in this talk is people who, um, they really believe in who you are. They believe in your potential. They believe that this person is going to be, you know, growing up to become a great human being. Someone who can be successful, who can go out and do great things in the world. And it's very hard to find people like that. Sometimes people just want to hear the very basic things. So for example, if someone comes up to you and they say, you know, how's your day? And you say, good. Right? Or you say, like, ah, oh, it's okay. And that's all they care about, and that's the end of the conversation for them. They don't feel like they want to ask you anything more. They might be a good friend, but they may not be a great friend. Because great friends are people that will go out of their way to say, okay, these are the things that I really care about. How was school? How are these friends that you, know, that you usually see? How's your family? They're going to ask a little bit more about you because they do really care about you. And they're willing to sacrifice for you. This is basically what Joanne said, word for word. And they cultivate to eradicate your karma on your behalf. This is probably the only one that is specific to Buddhism. And the reason why I bring this up is because they mentioned the altruistic co-living program. That's something that I took part in. I went to go pray for my grandma um, when she was sick. And this is something that I think is really, really special because all the dharma that we teach, it is for you, but it is for you to use to pray for other people and help other people. In the end, everything we do is basically giving you all the tools you need so that when the time comes, you have all the tools in your toolkit to take out and help other people. They give you more than they receive from you, and yet they never ask for anything in return. Okay, that's selflessness. Another version of selflessness is that they don't ask for any recognition. They don't ask you for recognition. For example, um, if you happen to, let's say, give a present to someone, right? And it's meant to be, let's say it's Secret Santa, right? And you get a really, really nice gift. You think it's the best gift out of all the people who gave people gifts that year. You don't expect them to brag about the fact that you were the one that gave them that gift. And this is the last one. They never turn your, they back on you no matter how bad you become. Um, this one's kind of tough to understand right now because all of you guys are really good kids. But you might have friends one day that maybe they're really good friends with you right now. And eventually they'll get to a point where maybe they make a mistake, they make a bad turn. Good friends and great friends are people who, they never turn their back on those people. They always believe that they have faith in the goodness of that person. They used to be a good person, they, maybe they still are, maybe they made a mistake, but you always believe that they can bounce back and you can help them get back. Yes? I have a comment. As I um, read through all of the descriptions for good friends and great friends, as parents, we kind of think that we are, that we, are do, that we do all of these things that you've listed on there. That we have your back, that we help you stay focused to reach your potential, that we sacrifice for you, that we do all of these things that were listed there. I think maybe they didn't mean for us to say this, but it's, it's meant, the message is for you to become good friends and great friends with each other. But as I read through this, I think we parents are kind of like good friends and great friends to our kids. I don't know. Um, you think? No. Yeah. Yes. But, but then one thing different that the, the communication. You can be like caregiver, you think, but and therefore them support. But they not necessarily consider us as friends because the communication comes. Okay. So I feel free to talk and think This is a good discussion. I think that we should all engage in this discussion because the parents have opened up the discussion. They've extended their hand. They want to communicate with us and we should communicate with them. So I'll start. I consider my best friends to be my dad and my mom. For the entire time I was growing up, I told a couple of you guys uh, last night that I didn't have a lot of close friends in high school. I didn't have a lot of close friends in undergrad, in college. I only really started having really close friends this year in my master's program. And this is after being alive for 23 years. The reason why I consider my parents to be my good friends and even my best friends is because they do have my back. 
they do have a lot of things that they know about me. They know me better than I know myself sometimes. They know my weaknesses and my flaws. They when I need help and I need honest feedback, I go to them. Because I know that they're not going to backstab me. Right? Like there's no there's no logic in that. Um, I think that uh, I definitely think that Quicko brings up a really good point, which is that there is a communication difference here. Um, a lot of people grow up and they don't get to spend time with their parents the same way that maybe I got to spend time with my parents. Um, so I kind of want to ask you guys, right? What do you guys think? Do you guys think that parents can be friends? Can parents be good friends? Are they best friends? What are they to you guys? Who said family? Your parents are family, yes. That is a given. <laughs> family friend. They are family friends. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. oh, no. <laughs> situations it's both they can be your friend in regards to like how you talk to them but there's a certain line of respect that you should have that distinguishes them from your friends mm -hmm. to where they are able to discipline you and help you grow in a way that your friends can't and they nurture you to be better people yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know why they agree um, I think there are certain things that, as young people, we go through. Um, even for me, like I'm closer to you in age than your parents are to you in age. But there's still a lot of things that I don't fully understand why you do what you do. Like to me, it just like doesn't make sense. So I can only imagine what it must be like for someone like you to explain to your parents what TikTok is and why you want to do that. Um, like your parents might just be like, like, what is this, right? And and for me, I still feel like they're just old, right? Maybe it just sounds like a, an old mentality, but like I also don't really fully understand what the point of TikTok is either. Um, besides, I, mean, I like watching them, but I wouldn't meet them. So um, there's a lot of things that you can kind of relate to people your age, and that's kind of the reason why we have CSSU, right? So that you guys can have safe people that you guys can talk to within your age group and kind of bond that way but also have people who are, you can consider your good friends and the adults that we have for other reasons, for other purposes that you might need that are a little bit more important, things that people your age cannot help you solve. Right? There are certain things that come with wisdom and experience that I cannot possibly help you with, that an adult can help you with, and vice versa. So I think that kind of, um, that's a really good observation, Dad. Thanks a lot for that. And then we'll miss a body friend. What's a body friend to you? A body salary friend to you? Who has seen this movie? Best movie ever. Underrated. Great movie. So, uh, what's a body friend to you? Yes, Macy? Like a friend that will like, risk anything for you. Okay. Risk anything for you. Okay. Um, a spiritual friend? That's interesting. Um, so, um, Bell and Emily are part of this group called Ping Yi Tan Tae, which is um, a, a, it's a scout group, but it's kind of tailored towards uh, their faith, which is Catholicism. And that's something that's really interesting because there's certain bonding experiences that you can go through with people who have the same faith as you. Um, you might have people who are the same kind of level of intensity of friends in school, but when times get tough and you want to kind of turn to a higher power, you want to turn to, for example, God or Buddha or whatever your faith may be, you can talk to someone about it and they understand what you're going through and they can kind of help you with that. If I'm the same faith as you and you have something that you want to pray for, I can go do so yeah, we have for you. I can go become a monk and pray for you during the time. Whereas for other people, you can't. That's a good way. So let's go ahead and hop into this one. This one has two, I think. So Bodhisattva friends are people who do all the things of a good friend and a great friend, plus they dedicate their lives to develop the complete... Okay, this is... Okay, let me unpack this real quick. 
because this is definitely Dave's, like, the way he wrote it. <laughs> Dedicate their lives to de develop the complete unfoldment of goodness, capacity, wisdom, and skills and needs of people, including you. Okay, so you can tell that I didn't write this, okay, because this is very Dave's speak. Um, okay, so they dedicate their lives, right? This is pretty easy. You dedicate their lives to, to develop. They develop you, right? They develop you in terms of helping you become a good person, compassionate, wise. These are things that we're doing in CSS right now. We're teaching you how to open up your heart to become compassionate. The drama itself I'm teaching you will help you become wiser whenever you decide to actually apply the drama. And the skills and means and people. Skills and means took me a really long time to understand because no one explained it to me. It was actually not that hard. Skills and means basically means that you have all the things in your toolbox ready for you to take out at any time. If you don't have the skills, okay, you don't actually have the means to actually help anyone else. The means is basically the opportunity. If you don't have the wisdom, then you actually don't have the opportunity to see anything that you can help people with. If you don't know the way to help people, right, your compassion is not there, then you don't have the means or the skill really to help anyone else either. Okay? So that's basically what it means. You have the opportunity, you have the tools you need to actually do things for other people. Bodhisattva friends are wise, knowledgeable, and emotionally and spiritually mature. I'm going to delve really quickly into what it means to be emotionally and spiritually mature because when I read this the first time, I had to think really hard about what that means. So, really quick before we go to the next slide, while you guys are writing this stuff down, what does it mean to be emotionally mature? This is a good talk. This is a good talk for some of you because you guys asked me this question yesterday. What does it mean to be emotionally mature? Do you get the parents to hop in and try to guess what this means? Wow. I think like you don't have to stay calm during situations that are like kind of dangerous. Stay calm during dangerous situations, okay? Depending on the situation, you may want to freak out, right? That might be better for you. Okay. But okay. Kenny, what do you think it means to be emotionally mature? Um, I assume that's like Basing your actions not completely off of like your emotions that okay. you're going directly. So like you have to kind of see what you're feeling and see which ones are like, what should be like used at the moment, I guess. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think it means to be spiritually mature? Mike? Oh, I didn't have to Oh, okay. Sorry. Tell me what do you think it means to be spiritually mature? I think like being knowledgeable is one, but also being aware of where you are spiritually um, mm -hmm. on your own path. Yeah. If you know that you're just starting out with the Dharma, right? If you're just starting out with cultivation, you know that at the very beginning, which means that you have a lot of things to learn, right? There's a lot of things that you can learn from there. And so you shouldn't be picky about what you're picking and choosing to learn. Let's go to the next one. This basically breaks it down so that we actually know what we're talking about. Emotional maturity means that you're being kind, compassionate, selfless, forgiving, responsible, reliable, and trustworthy. These are things that when you deal with other people, these are the ways you should treat other people. If someone were to do something bad against you, you don't lash out at them, you forgive them. Right? You're, yeah, you have compassion towards them, you have kind towards them. If you work as part of the planning team, you know that I really emphasize the idea of being responsible, reliable. Those are things that, while you may think of it as just a working relationship or things that are not tied to your emotions, they are in a way that because, for example, if you do something and someone rubs you the wrong way and you decide to just leave them out to, you know, you hang them out to dry, that's not being very reliable or responsible to their well-being. Spiritual maturity is a little bit more short. It means that you are wise because you have the experience, you have the government to back you up. You're comprehensive in terms of seeing things, the cause and effect of things in the future. You do something, this means this will happen. Someone else does something, you can see the long term what will happen. So if you guys were, who were talking to me late last night, we talked a little bit about that. Um, it means that you're humble. If you are always humble, then that means that a lot of people will be willing to help you because they don't think that you're a jerk, right? If you come off as someone who um, thinks they know everything, no one's going to help you. And then knowledgeable. And knowledgeable in a holistic way, meaning that 
Um, a lot of you guys I've talked to before about the fact that um, I feel personally that when I grew up, I read a lot. I was reading a lot of books at home. I used to read a lot of books uh, in high school and in undergrad too. I feel like all the books that I read, no matter what topic it was, helped me a lot in terms of my world knowledge. Um, you can talk to me about pretty much any topic, and unless it's incredibly specialized, I could have a decent conversation with you. And that's holistic knowledge. And that's something that we kind of want to strive for, rather than only knowing things about what we like. So, uh, whether you're very passionate about video games, whether you're passionate about uh, cross country, whether you're passionate about singing, if you only know that one topic, it's going to be very hard for you to relate to other people and help other people. Because then you can only relate to the people who share an interest with you. So do you guys think that emotional and spiritual maturity occur on their own without effort? Or do you think that you need to put in effort for this? Discussions. 
I want to actually break this up into five different groups. I want all the young people together. I want all the old people together. Five different old, old people are not parents. <laughs> <laughs> old as in like y'all you okay? <laughs> so <laughs> Okay, so very quickly, get into these groups. I want groups no bigger than maybe three or four, okay? And then uh, once you guys get into these groups, I'll assign the question to each of you. Okay? This will be only five minutes, so very, let's hurry up and get through this as quickly as possible. Are you the same Are you Three seconds. 